We are particularly excited and honoured this year, ladies and gentlemen, to be joined by a titan of the environmental movement. Ten years ago, Vice President Al Gore came here and shared his message about the urgency of the need for action on climate change. Now, there have been substantive inroads, of course, in the intervening years, and big blows. The Paris Agreement is no longer as strong as it was. I know you're all eager to hear from him as to where we are now, so without further ado, please welcome the former US Vice President, Al Gore. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank Krishnan Guru Murthy for his uh, introduction. And of course, uh, I want to first of all acknowledge uh, Sarah Butler Sloss, who has done a magnificent job in running this organization. Thank you so much, Sarah. As the founder and director and a judge as well, and uh, to you and uh, all of your team, to uh, the chair of the Ashton Board of Trustees, uh, Diana Fox uh, Carney, to uh, my uh, partner and co-founder of Generation Investment Management, David Blood, uh, who is here, uh, and one other personal uh, acknowledgement. Uh, there are some members of the, uh, the Climate Reality Project uh, here, Charles Perry and other climate reality attendees are here, and I wanted to uh, acknowledge them as well. Um, thank you very much. I want to thank all of the donors and those who have supported the Ashton Awards in multiple ways. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, the staff uh, and the team that uh, helps uh, Sarah make this uh, such an amazing uh, organization. Uh, and most of all, I want to offer my uh, congratulations uh, to the uh, award winners. Watching the videos and hearing the presentations, looking at some of the exhibits that were uh, set up in the other room, I have to say I'm extremely uh, inspired by the work that has been done and is ongoing. These are extremely important projects, not only because of the good they do for the individuals and the families, the communities, and the businesses that you have seen uh, are already benefiting, but also because these award winners are examples that inspire others in their communities, in their nations, and people like us who are learning about their amazing work. This is an example, this movement, uh, is an example of growing from the bottom up and not from the top down. These are also examples that can inspire policymakers, governmental officials, community leaders to multiply the success stories that are on such vivid display. And it's not just a display, it is tangible help to improve the quality of life and to improve the quality of the environment. And it all adds up to improve our chances uh, as the human race to solve the climate crisis in time. I want to uh, echo uh, the words of one of the award winners here who was emboldened to ask for uh, more monetary help. I, 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 that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> but uh, these investors here, these investors uh, and donors have already done fantastic work. But some of you know that these projects, after receiving an Ashton Award, are then not only recognized and honored, they instantly become more successful. Pe more people know about what they can do, more people are encouraged to help them reach more customers and 
families and communities. So the impact of these awards uh, is larger still. Uh, and there are amazing success stories. Over the 10 years since I was last year, last year I have looked at some of the statistics and it's, it's quite uh, impressive. So many of the award winners end up doubling the number of people they can help and are helping in the year following their receipt of the award. So we should all look at this as an opportunity to help them do what they have already proven they can do uh, and do it successfully uh, with more people. Ashton, as you can see, is committed to championing our much needed transition to a clean energy economy uh, by recognizing innovation and leadership that is successful in accelerating that transition. This select group of now more than 200 people and organizations are collectively impacting the lives of more than 80 million people around the world with the support of this organization. That is a remarkable record, Sarah. Fantastic. Tonight's recipients are providing access to energy. They're providing jobs. They're providing light for girls and boys to study uh, at night. They're reducing the carbon footprint of cities through more efficient infrastructure, including buildings, innovative transportation uh, successes, uh, energy distribution, and uh, data analysis. So it, it really covers the gamut. Before I close, I, I want to add some words about why this issue is so urgent. There are really only three questions remaining where the climate crisis is concerned. The first, for some still, is do we really have to change? Must we change? The second question is, can we change? And the third question, perhaps the most important, is will we change? First of all, we must change not only because the global scientific community has been virtually unanimous in telling us that the science is crystal clear, but also because there is a new advocate more persuasive than all the scientists put together. Mother Nature is telling us we must change. A year ago, December, the United Kingdom had the heaviest rainfalls in recorded history with flooding that caused a great deal of suffering. In some of the developing countries that have been represented on this stage tonight, we've already heard about the changes in the timing of rainfalls, the periodicity of rainfalls. For generations running back till the memory of man uh, cannot track it further, generations have been able to rely on a rainy season, dry season pattern to decide when to plant and when to harvest. But all of those well-known patterns are being disrupted because more of the precipitation falls in one time large downpours at odd times of the year, out of season. And then during the periods between the rainfalls, the extra heat in the atmosphere pulls the soil moisture more quickly out of the ground, makes the droughts appear more readily, last longer, and have a deeper impact. The entire water cycle of the Earth is being disrupted because we're now we put 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every day, and the accumulated amount that uh, now is up there traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth system each day than would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. It's a big planet, but that is an enormous amount of energy. 
The air temperatures are going up. You know well that 16 of the 17 hottest years ever measured have been since 2001. You know the ice is melting and in places like uh, Bangladesh and the Maldives or Miami Beach, Florida, uh, there are now fish from the ocean swimming in streets that are not intended for fishing. 90% of that heat is going into the oceans, and that is what is disrupting the, the water cycle. We're seeing the spread of diseases to latitudes where people are not familiar with them. We're seeing the storms get stronger. So the answer to the first question, must we change, is increasingly clear and obvious. Yes, we must change. And by the way, uh, the scientists, many of them here in the UK, who predicted con these consequences uh, long ago, have already been proven right. So because their record has been validated, we should listen very carefully to what they tell us would happen if we did not make these changes to prevent the most catastrophic outcomes that would occur if we did not change. So yes, we must change. The answer to the second question, can we change, was visible on this stage this evening. Yes, we can change. There is now in our world a sustainability revolution. And it's best understood, in my view, by placing it in the context of other great global transformations. The agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the digital revolution. This sustainability revolution has the breadth and magnitude of the industrial revolution, but it has the speed of the digital revolution. And instead of beginning in a corner of the United Kingdom, in a world of one and a half billion people, and then slowly spreading to Western Europe and North America, this sustainability revolution is being jump-started in rich and poor countries alike in every corner of this world of 7.4 billion people. We heard a lot about solar, for example, this evening. The Earth gets more energy from the sun in one hour than all of the energy used by the entire global economy over the course of an entire year. So as we learn how to more effectively and profitably harvest a larger fraction of that energy and put it to use improving people's lives, the examples thus provided are imitated by neighbors and by other communities, and it, that is spreading all over the world. This sustainability revolution is growing in speed and magnitude, but it is not yet growing as fast as it must because we have not yet reached the point where the emissions of global warming pollution are starting to come down. We have, over the last three years, seen for the first time in the absence of a depression or great recession, for the first time we've seen a stabilizing of global, uh, of global warming pollution worldwide. And the first hint that it is beginning to decline. Looks like an inflection point. The great uh, economist, uh, the late R Rudy Dornbush, once said, Things take longer to happen than you think they will. And then they happen much faster than you thought they could. We heard about mobile phones and mobile payments, so common now in East Africa, now West Africa, South Asia. Uh, I remember very well in the year 1980, I was an early adopter of one of those first large mobile phones. I thought it looked so cool, I couldn't wait to show my friends. Now I look at the picture of pictures of me carrying that huge bulky device and I think it looks ridiculous. But at about that time, one of the great communications companies of the planet in my country asked one of the great global research institutions, how many of these can we sell by the year 2000? 
and they did voluminous research and reported back the good news they could sell 900,000 of them by the year 2000. <laughs> and there was great excitement, and they went to work. And when the year 2000 arrived, sure enough, they did sell 900,000 of them in the first three days of the year. <laughs> and by the end of the year, 120 million. The bulk of those mobile phone sales were in developing countries that did not have landline telephone grids. They were able to leapfrog the old technologies that wealthy countries had invested in for a century. And they now have mobile payments on telephones to a much greater extent than we do in the United States or in the United Kingdom. The same thing is happening with solar energy and with a lot of the new sustainability revolution technologies that are now spreading quickly around the world. So this is uh, an exciting time. And I want to comment, since you mentioned uh, the Paris Agreement, I had worried when the president of my country <coughs> was uh, <laughs> was, I'm sorry, I, believe me, I meant no. What did I mean? <laughs> I'm in another country, I meant no, no disrespect. But when, when the president of my country was preparing to make his announcement about the Paris Agreement and we did not know what it would be, I was very worried that if he pulled the U.S. out of the agreement, then other countries, perhaps those not entirely enthusiastic about the Paris Agreement, would use it as an excuse for pulling out themselves. I can tell you that in the aftermath of that decision, there has been no such cascade of other countries following the decision announced uh, by President Trump. To the contrary, what I have seen and heard is an expression of solidarity, not only in all of the other countries of the world, but also on the part of governors of states and mayors of cities and leaders of businesses in the United States of America. No one person can stop the climate movement or the sustainability revolution, we are going to win no matter what President Donald Trump tries to do. Since the, the Paris Agreement, I believe, is actually stronger today. I say that uh, with all sincerity and conviction. Since the Paris Agreement was reached, Many hundreds of coal plants have been canceled in China and India and in quite a few other places. We saw just uh, uh, two days ago the announcement that the sales of coal fell in the year just measured by a larger amount than ever uh, in history. We have seen uh, the beginning of construction of large utility scale solar farms and wind farms, and the introduction of many other new sustainability technologies. India just announced a major switch from its plans for a lot more coal-fired plants to a stunning increase in solar farms. And India just announced three weeks ago that within 13 years, 100% of the vehicles in India must be electric vehicles. That is a dramatic and, and inspiring announcement. We can change. We must change, and we can change. So what about that final question? Will we change? Just as the sustainability revolution should be understood in the context of the, revolu the technological revolutions that came before it. The climate movement should be seen in the context of the great moral causes 
that have transformed and improved the outlook for humanity. In every one of the great moral movements, there has been discouragement. There has been despair. There have been advocates who asked, how long will this take? Is it ever going to succeed? The abolition movement, which began more than 200 years ago here in this country, met with such ferocious opposition, many felt it's a lost cause, but it prevailed. The women's suffrage movement in this country, in my country, and around the world was met with no, no, no after no. But it prevailed. The civil rights movement in my country, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, more recently, the gay rights movement uh, in so many parts of the world. What all of these transformative movements have had in common is that they met with the same kind of ferocious resistance that led to despair on the part of many advocates. Nelson, the late Nelson Mandela once said, it's always impossible until it's done. We have seen people continue in spite of their concern that it might be impossible. During some of the bleakest days of the civil rights movement in my country, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was asked by one of his fellow advocates, how long is this going to take? And he famously answered, how long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And in every single case, when the obfuscations and the side issues and the distractions were cleared away, what was left was a very simple and clear choice, a binary choice, between what is right and what is wrong. It was wrong to allow slavery to continue. It was wrong to deny women the right to vote. It was wrong to discriminate on the basis of skin color or who you fell in love with. It was wrong to allow apartheid to continue. And when the central issue was thus framed in stark relief, because of who we are as human beings, the outcome became foreordained. We chose what was right. And now in this case, it is clearly wrong to destroy the prospects of living prosperously and sustainably on a clean earth when we bequeath it to our children. It is wrong to use the sky as an open sewer. It is wrong to condemn future generations to a lifetime haunted by continual declines in their standard of living and give them a world with political disruption and all the chaos that the scientists have warned us about. It is right to give them hope. It is right to give them a clean future and a sustainable and prosperous future. And for those who say we may not have the will to change, Always remember that the will to change is itself a renewable resource. Thank you.